we're, uh, we're starting a brand new book of the Bible uh, this week. So if you've got your Bible with you or um, it's on your phone, you can turn or swipe to the New Testament and the book of James. Um, now, we'd normally have a fancy slide, wouldn't we, with the title of the series. It will be here next week, I promise. Um, but, but our title for the series is James Authentic Christian Living. Authentic Christian Living. Um, James is the younger brother of Jesus. That must have been tough, mustn't it, growing up? Because life would have been fairly normal. And can you imagine being Jesus's younger brother? You'd always be wrong, wouldn't you? Can you, can you imagine, you know, Mary's in the kitchen cooking, um, I don't know what they'd eat. Probably nice things that I like, sort of like Mediterranean food. And she'd hear the boys scrapping because they'd scrap. And she'd just say, James, you're in the wrong. I'm busy. Spank yourself. It was tough. Um, so this morning we're going we're gonna to look at, well, the passage is the first 18 verses of chapter one, but we're going to look at some specific verses. Uh, and, and the title is The Joy-Filled Life. Um, and boy, is this appropriate for what is going on at the moment, what we were praying about at the beginning of the service, because it's looking at the joy-filled life in the midst of all the trials and tough times that come along. So, um, yeah, it, it talks about trials, pains, problems, perils. And there are three points that come out of the sermon. If you're going to survive, you have to find God through the trials. If you're going to survive, you have to find joy through the trials. And you have to find wisdom in the midst of the trials. So I could sit down now if you wanted, because you've heard the sermon, but we'll expand slightly. Shall we jump right in? I'm giving Mike um, on the PA desk, desk a deliberately hard time today because um, he's got to follow what I'm saying and flick the right verse up at the right time. So if he gets it wrong, be gracious. He won't. He's very good. Um, so it starts, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So James calls his big brother, Jesus, the Lord. If Jesus wasn't perfect, James would tell us. If Jesus didn't declare himself God, James wouldn't have believed it because he knew him up close and personal. He was with him every day. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, James wouldn't have followed him. One of the greatest arguments in apologetics that, that Jesus is God is that he was without sin and that he rose from the dead. James was up close. No one was closer. And he believed those things because he saw them. Verse 2, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion greetings. This is about who is sending the letter and who they're sending it to. Because if you're going to read a book of the Bible and understand the purpose and meaning of the message, you need to understand who's written it and who's, who it's been written to, what the context is. He writes, probably largely to Jewish Christians at this time, who've been dispersed, scattered. They've moved. Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament Jewish prophecy. And what, what's happened here, um, in a really distilled nutshell, is that the government was bad. And they made it hard for believers to give, live good lives. So the people scattered. It says in, in, in Mark um, that they, they came and they saw. And they said, is, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James? And then it mentions that Jesus had a few other brothers, Joseph, Judas, Simon, and he had some sisters as well. 
Jesus came from a large family with lots of brothers and sisters. He's, he was the biological child of Mary and the adopted child of Joseph. And as Jesus was going through his trials, you'd hope that his family would be really supportive in the same way that I would hope that in the trials you're all going through or go through, that your family would be supportive of you. But that wasn't always the case. It says in Luke um, that his family came when he, he declared that he was God. And he said, please. And they said, please um, go and get Jesus. We need to take him home. Were they thinking he'd lost his mind? Sometimes the people who are the closest to us don't have the best perspective on us. Sometimes the people who grew up with us don't understand us and who we've ultimately become. Jesus' family loved him. But when he was saying he was God, they wanted to take him home. Perhaps they were a bit embarrassed. I don't know. It says in John chapter 7, verse 5, that even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus was going through his trials just as we do. And his family at the time wasn't necessarily the most helpful. If your family is not helpful this morning, congratulations, it's biblical. But the good news is that although James's relationship with Jesus might have started poorly, it ended well. And that would be my prayer for you this morning. You, you may have heard about Jesus this morning, but you may not yet have fully received him as your Lord and Saviour and King. But that's why you're here. This is part of your journey, coming to understand Jesus and to trust in him and to trust in what he does for you in the way that his own brother, James, had to. Everything changes in James's life when Jesus is risen from the dead. He's there on the cross and James is watching his brother die. He goes to the funeral, he sheds tears, he grieves. And then three days later, Jesus returns. James was there. And it says in, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to James. I hope the first thing that James said was sorry for not believing that Jesus was God or that he would rise from the dead. But as soon as he rose from the dead, James knew that his brother was God. Only God forgives sin and defeats death. In Acts chapter 1, one of the first Christian get-togethers after the resurrection of Jesus, it included Mary, his mum. And it says Jesus is Jesus's brother was there. James. By Galatians chapter 1 and 2, he'd become a leader in the early church. And Paul says this, when I was commissioned by God, I needed to meet with the senior leaders. So I met with Peter, the leader of the disciples, John, Jesus's best friend, and James, his brother. The point is that he started by disbelieving Jesus. He loved him, but he disbelieved him. And he ended up believing in him. When he says, James, a servant of Jesus. I guess a lot of us would have chucked a few more words in at that point. We might have said, um, you might have heard of my brother, Jesus. But there was no name dropping. Instead, he just says, James, a servant. What he's come to conclude is that Jesus came to earth to serve us and therefore serving others on behalf of Jesus is a noble high calling. And then there's the good news. Jesus says in Mark chapter 3 verse 35, anyone who does the will of, of God is my brother, my sister, my mother. The point is this, if you belong to God, You've been adopted into the family of God. Jesus Christ is your brother. James is your brother. We're part of God's family and God is part of our family. And that's what he's saying over our life in human history. 
the trials, the troubles, the tribulations that we face. Over them is the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing that he's telling us in this passage is that you need to find God over your trouble, over your trial. And the next big thing is a lot harder. We need to find joy in our trial. In, uh, in verses 2 and 3, it says, uh, count it all, what, what, what is it? Count it all, joy. <sighs> We'd live in a, a world that lacks joy. Well, it lacks joy in our house far too often, doesn't it, Ben? Because I'm miserable. <laughs> but it is often a joyless, cheerless world. Count it all. All of it. All of it. Count it all joy. You're in God's family if you believe in Jesus when you meet your trials. When you meet your trials, it doesn't say if you meet your trials, does it? That's a shame. Perhaps James got that wrong. The question is, we're all going to meet our next trial at some point. It's coming. A trial is a walk through the, the valley of the shadow of death. We can often think when we're faced with a trial, I can take an aeroplane ticket over the top of it or pay a toll to go on the road around it, don't we? That's kind of what we think. But we've got to go through it. Count it all a joy when you fight, face trials of many kinds. He goes on, for you know, it's a promise, there's certainty, it's a guarantee that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. What he's talking about here is having joy in the midst of going through a trial. It's a confusing word because sometimes our trials are confusing. The particular word trial sometimes is translated as trouble or difficulty. That's how we experience our trial, isn't it? It can be troubling, it can be difficult. It causes anxiety, worry. It's confusing because I've never been here before. I've never gone through this before. I've never felt like this before. I've never faced this before. I've never dealt with it before. It's new to me. So we can be confused and scared. It can hurt. It can be worrying. You can feel like you're in danger. Some English translations of the word um, also um, translate this word is temptation, which is interesting. But I read a commentary that helpfully said it's two sides of the same coin. Something happens and you decide if it's a trial or a temptation based on how you respond to the situation you're going through. If you side with Satan, you turn it into temptation. You'll excuse your sin. You'll excuse your rebellion against God. You give in to that thing which is tempting you. If you yield and submit, on the other hand, to the Holy Spirit when the trial comes along, it becomes a test. And some translations use that word test. A test is something that you have to graduate from. If you pass the test, you move on to the next level of maturity. The good news is that if you fail the test, God lets you do a retake. With James, throughout Jesus' early life, he failed his test. But God was gracious and James kept retaking the test. Then he passed. God was gracious to him and he's gracious to us. A failed test in the past doesn't mean that God is done with you. Just the opposite. You get to take it again. You get to graduate to the next level of maturity. So, so let's, just, let's just pause and think for a moment about the trials, the troubles, the difficulties, the temptations that 
that we're facing at the moment? What is it that you're dealing with? What's difficult in our day-to-day life? Why is it that there seems to be, and I think, I think this is actually fact, I think this is actually true, that there are more trials now in our lives than there ever has been? When James wrote this, life would have been a bit simpler, a bit more straightforward. The world wasn't as interconnected. You lived in a village. That village was pretty much the extent of your world. There was no internet, no multinational companies, no trade between nations, no travel around the world. So now, all of a sudden, we've got global problems, international problems, national problems, regional problems. There are people that we love, and they've got problems. You have a family or friend and, and uh, friends, and when they hurt, you hurt, don't you? You're participating in their trial because you have affection for them. And then we've got our own problems, our own troubles, trials, tribulations, pains, perils. For some people right now, that might be financial. How many of us now are we having spiritual struggles? We might, we might know that God loves us, but just right now we're not feeling it. It says in the word of God that God is near you, but you might not sense it. How many of us now are going through trials that are relational? People that we dearly love. There's a distance, a fracture between us it's complicated it's conflicted for some of us right now our trials might be emotional you're anxious overwhelmed tired you're worn out for some of us it will be mental i just don't know how much more of this i can cope with i've hit the limit of my humanity i don't need to talk about health trials this morning do i And trials can be (laughs) like an avalanche on our soul. We've often said, declare myself, that if if one thing comes along, that's a rarity. When you're facing a trial, there'll be three all at the same time. They come along like buses. They do, it's true. One thing happens and then another and another. And then you don't really have the time to process it. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. There's this guy in the, in the Bible called Job. And that's what he experiences. Trial after trial after trial. No opportunity to process one before the next one hits. And, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes you think, oh, I'm having a rough week. And the rough week suddenly becomes a rough month. And before you know it, it's been a rough decade. So, sorry if you're here and you're young. You probably think I'm talking nonsense, but when you get as old as me, you'll know I'm telling the truth. The question is, how do we find joy in it? Because I tell you what, a cheerless Christianity, and you see cheerless Christians all the time, folks. A cheerless Christianity is a bad advert for the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and the party that never ends in the kingdom of God. And so what he's talking about here is finding joy in the middle of all the things that are going to happen. The trial itself is generally speaking not a gift from God. Let's not be weird about it. But it can be used by God to bless you. If you receive it and use it. Trials strip away other objects of our faith other than Jesus that we can put our hope in. I've heard people say that they were leaning on their parents' faith in Christ. And then their parents die. That they trusted in their health. And then they were sick. That they trusted in their bank account for a good night's sleep and then it diminished and they couldn't sleep. When trials come, people and things that we have put our faith in are shaken and they're removed. 
I think we saw that in COVID, didn't we? And it reveals to us that truly only God is unshaken and unmovable. So when we're in our trials and tribulations, don't try and buy a plane ticket out of them or detour around them or avoid them. Embrace them and trust God in them. Run to him, run into his arms. In addition, when we go through trials, it can reveal to us our true self, what we're really like. If you need to know what I'm like when I'm going through a trial, I'm not going to tell you, but, but they will. We can get angry. We can become fearful. We can take it out on, our, on the people that are closest to us that we love the most. Sometimes pressure reveals our true selves and we're shocked. Equally, I've seen people go through the worst times and it revealed the best character in them. In addition, trials reveal not just who you are, but who those are around you. <laughs> a few years ago, I went through a, a, a tough time, a, a, a searching trial. And some people who I, particularly in the context of work, some people I work with who I thought were my closest friends, We'd been through loads together. Where, where have they gone? They just vanished. Not, not all of them, but a significant number of them. And yet other people who you barely knew were like a rock. So there are people, when hardship comes, it's like, yeah, good luck. They're gone. And then there's other people you hardly know who walk with and carry your burden through life. In addition, what trials do is they remind us that, that something's gone terribly wrong with our world. And that ultimately our world has a God-sized problem. Until Jesus returns, we're still in the middle of the mess that we've made. Sometimes trials just remind us that we're not in heaven yet. Sometimes what happens when we tell people about Jesus um, is that we say, accept Jesus into your life as your Lord and Saviour. And you'll be with him for heaven and eternity. All of that's true, isn't it? But we leave out the bit in the middle. Heaven's coming, but trials in the meantime need to be endured with his help, for his glory. In addition, one of the things that a trial does is it simplifies life. And it reveals to us what really matters. I think in my thinking, that's kind of happened this week with, with, with Mike's situation. It reveals to you what really matters. Sometimes there are things or experiences or positions or possessions that we have, that we treasure. And then the trial comes and it shakes us. And we think that job, that relationship, that super body that I have from going to the gym. <laughs> yeah, clearly I'm joking. <laughs> clearly. I don't even care about that anymore. That doesn't matter because we're shaken. God, this winds us up, doesn't it? Anyone here like gaming? Yeah, you do. You're just not putting your hands up. So you're at home and the internet connection is rubbish. And you get really frustrated and you shout at your parents, Dad, get a better internet connection. They're like, they've done it. They've done it. They know that I'm telling the truth. It seems like a big deal. And then the phone rings with some tragic, unexpected news. I don't care about Netflix anymore. What happens in a trial is that we're jolted out of this ridiculous, normal routine of life. And it reveals to us what really matters and what really doesn't matter, ultimately. That's why a trial is called a test. Your trial is testing your faith. And we take a test and we can pass it or fail it. Your trial is coming to you and you will be tested. 
Some of you are going things ne- through things now that are, tra- that are traumatic and overwhelming. But we want to just pass them and move on. The only way to graduate is to learn to rejoice. The world knows nothing about this because the world doesn't know God. There's a line in the Bible that will change your life if you receive it and embrace it. This is true. Rejoice in the Lord. The reason the world can't rejoice is because they don't have the Lord. They don't rejoice in the world. We rejoice in the Lord to get us through the world. I'll say that again. We rejoice in the Lord to get us through the world. The trial is out there, but there can still be joy in it. It may not change things, but it changes you as you go through things. I'm telling you that I don't think that our world is going to be a joyful place in our lifetime. I don't think in our lifetime, guys, I'm I'm sorry, but I just don't think the world is going to be wonderful. But something is, uh, is over everything that will ever happen. The Lord is over everything that will ever happen. Let's not deny reality. Some people deny reality. How are you doing in this really difficult time? I'm great. Anything I can pray uh, about for you? No, no, it's all good. You need a flipping drug test, if that's you, because you're denying reality. It's true, but it's true, isn't it? You're laughing, but it's true. The funniest things are the things that are true. This isn't a denial of reality, but it's an awareness of the presence of God in your life that is a greater reality than what you're going through. That's where joy comes from. It doesn't, joy doesn't deny what's happening out there, but it has faith that the Holy Spirit is here with you. And the, and, and the fruit of the Spirit includes joy. Our old friend, our old friend Nehemiah, if you're here for the first time, two weeks ago we finished preaching through Nehemiah, so he's our old friend. He says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. The reason He's going to set before us this pursuit of joy. That James is setting before us this pursuit of joy is because your body needs air, water, food as fuel. But your soul, what does your soul need? Joy. Your soul feeds off joy. Once you learn to rejoice in the Lord, the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. It strengthens you to deal with reality. Now, how how many of you right now, um, can I be honest, how many of you right now, you've struggled with anxiety in the last few weeks? Some days might have been really, really hard for you. How on earth do you rejoice in the midst of that? Well, one way we can rejoice in our trials is to remind ourselves that Jesus has been through it. God, who's above all, he was sinless. The one who loves you has nonetheless been through trials. We've a God who, it says in the Bible, sympathizes and identifies with us because he's been there. So when we talk to him we in, and, and we invite him in, he understands what it is that we're going through, how we feel, because he's been there. In addition, the trial can grow in new character as you become more Christ-like. The Bible has this crazy line in Hebrews. It says that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. There are things that you know in theory, that you believe in, but when you experience them, you 
you understand them in a different reality. Does that make sense? So, so I, I believe that God hears and answers prayers. But when he does it, you believe it even more, don't you? When you look back in your life to all of the times that God has answered prayer, it causes faith to rise in your heart even more for the even bigger things that you'll face in the days to come. I am. Um, I was, I'm bragging, I, I, I apologise, I'm bragging. I was laying on the beach two or three days before Christmas in Barbados. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. The Willises know what I'm talking about. Sipping a cocktail. And my phone pinged. And a mate of mine had sent me a, I'm going completely off piece, I apologise. A friend of mine sent me a, a LinkedIn job advert uh, from my biggest client. And my biggest client had advertised a job for what I do for them as a consultant. That's how I found out. I just lost my biggest client. Great. Anyway, that's by the by. This week, last week, my next biggest client rang me up. Uh, I, was, I was going to pick Ben up from work. He rang me up and he gave me a really hard time about something. I mean, really hard time. He was ticking me off like you'd tick a five-year-old off. It was awful. I went home and I opened up the computer and I looked at what I'd sent him and I it's fine. I don't know what he was going on about. But he's a proud guy. And I had to go and see him this week. And I was dreading it. Oh, it's true. I'm completely honest with you. I was dreading it because I thought, is he going to sack me? I've just lost my biggest client. Is this it? Shall I retire? This is, only, this is true. <laughs> it was the loveliest meeting possible. And I prayed all the way. It was the loveliest meeting possible. He appreciated me and what I was doing for him. And do you know what? I appreciated the truth that God hears and answers our prayers even more as a consequence of dreading going and seeing that guy. So there are things we know in theory, but when we experience them, we know in truth. The other one is that, is, yeah, it's the same, isn't it? Same thing, really. God rescues the godly from their trials. And when he does, you get it. Your faith is in a faithful God. Your trial is an opportunity to, for him to prove his faithfulness to you and to prove his faith in his, in, in, to, and to prove your faith in his faithfulness. It can mature your character to be more Christ-like. Another reason we rejoice in the trial is that you pass it, you graduate. And never the level of maturity is unlocked for the next season in your life. Once you learn the lesson, you're ready for whatever God has to do for you next. God has been faithful to me. He's faithful to you. Um, many years ago, we had a trial. God, many years ago. Flip. We had just got married. We wanted to start a family. And seven years later, we still wanted to start a family. Nothing had happened. It was a trial. Going through that trial and seeing the faithfulness of God in it enables you to appreciate situations other people go through and to support them in a way that you would never be able to theoretically. Do you, do you know what I mean? You, you, many of you will have been through things that then enable you to support people in a completely different way than, than would have been the case. Oh, I've lost my place. Don't worry, I'll find it again. Sometimes our joy is in other people's joy, isn't it? If you can't rejoice in what you're going through today, you can rejoice in other people's joy. And here's, here's some more good news to encourage you that should give you joy. Whatever you're enduring, whatever you're suffering, you're storing up treasure in heaven. God's got this great inheritance plan, this fantastic retirement plan. I keep talking about retirement. It's my age. He's storing it up in heaven for you. I'm sorry. I am genuinely sorry. My heart breaks for what people are going through now. But I'm telling you that there is an, an, an eternal inheritance and reward for your faithfulness through hardship and trial and suffering and difficulty that is waiting for you. 
on our to-do list every day. I am rubbish at this. I'm so bad at it. But on our to-do list every day should be a top priority in finding joy. That's my challenge to you. Go for a walk. Just think about and shout out to God your praise for all of the things that he's done for you. Because joy will rise in your heart. You could spend a couple of hours every day doing nothing but thanking God for the specific things in your life that he's blessed you with. It might not change your life, but it will change you and your soul. And you will find that you can endure the trials you go through in finding joy. While I'm just turning the page, just dwell for a minute on the things in your life that you can dwell on that fill you with joy because of God's faithfulness. I'll take a bit of time turning the page. Your jo- you, you, need, you need joy in your trial, but you, lastly, third point, we're getting there. You need wisdom to get you through the trial. Verses four and five. Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. Have you ever not known what to do in a situation? Or perhaps I should say, have you ever had a day go past where you haven't known what to do? I just don't know what to do. Some of you are in the midst of that right now, but God is over it and he will give you joy and he'll give you wisdom through it. As things get darker, as things get darker, you need to go deeper. As you have more problems, you need to pray more. When you don't know what to do, God shouldn't be the last person that you talk to, but the first person you talk to. The reason sometimes we don't ask people for things is that other people aren't always generous, are they? God, your father, is a generous father. It says in verse uh, I think this is verse six. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person may not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man. Unstable in his ways. When trials come and you've not been there before, when it's new to you, you need God to take your hand like a child and walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. And that requires wisdom. Our world has an awful lot of knowledge in it. You can get your phone out and you can, right now, you can go on a Google and you can find out the answer to anything. You can find out the last time Ipswich beat Norwich, it wasn't yesterday. I promised that I wouldn't do that. <laughs> There's an, this is true. This is this is a fact. This is a bit of this is a bit of knowledge. It's not wisdom. The amount of knowledge doubles every year. There's twice as much information available today than there was a year ago. Evidently. There's an abundance of knowledge, but there's a scarcity of wisdom. Knowledge fills libraries, fills the the internet ether. Wisdom fills your life. Knowledge gives you information. But wisdom transforms you. Are you pursuing knowledge or wisdom? Sometimes the greatest obstacle to wisdom is the avalanche of knowledge that's out there. There are evidently, um, I love this, this is really, this amused me. There were two emotions that drive the internet and cause you to be addicted to your phone. Anger and fear. No one will ever turn to their phone as a source of joy. I wrote that last night. This morning, I, 
have to admit, I watched the highlights of the football on my phone and that did bring me joy. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. But it's true, isn't it? Ultimately, your phone exists to help you be fearful and anxious. So we rejoice in the Lord. We have to find the Lord over our trials. We find joy. Our trials and wisdom. Uh, our, uh, we find joy so that in our trials, we endure them with wisdom. When you wake first thing in the morning, if you open the word of God and you start in prayer, you're starting the day wisely. I want you to be hopeful. I want you to be joyful. I want you to be in the spirit. Far better to look at the word of God and to pray than turn to your phone and look at X. You need to be in the truth. God will use the truth to transform your life. To transform your mindset. It may not change what happens out there. But God will use his word to change who you are. With wisdom. You don't run away from your pain. You run to the Lord in your pain. Where are you going? I don't know. I haven't got a clue. I just know. I'm running away from what hurts. That is often our reaction. No. You need, to go the, you need to go to the one who heals those hurts. We've got to find the Lord over it, the joy in it, and the wisdom through it. Wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. All wisdom comes from the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of wisdom. The means that he's chosen to give you and I wisdom first of all, are through his word. That's why we read the Bible. Secondly, through prayer. He says, ask God. You're going to need to ask God some things and then listen to what he says to you. God's a great father. He gives generously to all without finding fault. And all you've got to do is just ask for help, talk to him and listen to him. And lastly, God gives wisdom through wise counsel. There are people uh, that we know in our lives who know the scriptures. They pray. They have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. We can go to them for wise counsel. And there are people who we have in our lives who we're probably better avoiding. And we know that because they don't give wise counsel. They stoke our anxieties. Look in your life for the people that give you wisdom and navigate the trial set before you with them. I was given this passage to preach on, I don't know, probably, I don't know, six weeks ago, whenever the rotor came out. And I wrote it, I started writing it on Tuesday before I knew what had happened to Mike. And it, it just has occurred to me how God orchestrates stuff, because this is about, in the trials, running to God, which is kind of what we're all feeling at the moment. How is it that God orchestrates stuff like that? Our God has made this world. He lived without sin. He suffered because he loved us so much that he chose to go through it with us, to identify with us, to die for us, to rise to life for us to go to heaven and prepare a place for us, to send the Spirit to comfort us and to lead us and to guide us and empower us, to give us hope, to lift our burdens from us, to guarantee our eternity. And he's going to return and we'll be resurrected from the dead and our tears will be no more, our trials will be no more, our problems will be no more because our God returns to reclaim everyone and everything that belongs to him as the creator. Amen? The, the band are going to come back and, 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 and lead us in worship. But um, I'm not actually going to pray. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I was going to pray, but I've been prompted by the Holy Spirit not to. Just as the band are working out what they're doing, just contemplate. Things in your life 
to give joy to God for this morning. Just now, in these last moments, just contemplate what it is in your life that you want to give thanks to God for, that you want to be filled with joy for because of what he's done for you. Amen.